Coast. Whereabouts is the exact location or relative location? The exact location is, well, it's Seattle. I'm about seven miles from Seattle, technically, but um, okay. it's on the east side, so Seattle's good enough. Seattle's good enough. All right, so hopefully those in the audience right now can say if this is coming through okay, because it is jumping around, but... So, before this show started, we were starting to talk a little bit about our difficulties and successes or things as far as working from home goes. A lot of people in the world are suddenly having to work at home for the first time, perhaps, or the first time that they've had to actually accomplish things at home. So, starting with Larry, how has your work situation been as far as have you been able to work at home or is your job still kind of holding up? Et cetera, et cetera. Uh, things are going okay for for the most part. Like I work for like an insurance company here, like here in Regina. It's it's a national insurance company, and there were some challenges, of course, uh, for setting it up, like the, the our work from home program. Uh, so it took them a little while to work out a few bugs with the the VPN system. They're still working on it a little bit, uh, but you know it's it's sort of a, a quick learning curve trying to get that all all in place. And for the most part, it's it's been going pretty pretty decently. And they did actually, uh, they've been quite good to us, like uh, been very understanding, like with uh, what they've been doing for the employees and trying to do everything they can to make accommodations and recognition of, of what's going on, like with the whole COVID-19 situation. So they're trying to keep us safe. And I really appreciate that. I think that's that's great. And, you know, everything will work out eventually. But uh, yeah, it's, I, I can understand it's probably like a, a, you know, a big stress on the telecoms too, like trying to support all this extra online traffic going on. So these, these things happen where not everything goes so smoothly. Even like with Facebook and stuff, uh, people are using that for communication. I've tried it a few times with my, my friends, and uh, yeah, sometimes it's a little uh, choppy and the video is not so great. But and, and just for the record, while we're getting connected together for this particular show, one of the four of us has been disconnecting pretty consistently, so we'll see if we can keep us all connected. But I suspect so part of that... Names. <laughs> not, yeah, not naming any names. But uh, I suspect part of that may very well be just that on Facebook side, like there's a lot of people doing video conferencing right now. And video, especially high quality video, is really relatively bandwidth intensive. And so we're hitting bottlenecks all over the place in weird places. And especially relevant to this, because from my experience in working from, even not from home, but like just working generally inside of these complex uh, software systems and hardware systems that run in the background and everyone just sort of takes for granted that they work all the time. There's a never ending supply of crises and things going horribly, horribly wrong on a good day. Like <laughs> there's very often things that go wrong and then the people have to get called out to fix it and people run around like crazy and then things eventually get fixed and everything is fine as far as the people using the systems are concerned. But now Keith, as far as your experience, how you're kind of mentioning a little bit of it before we started, but on your side, things are going 
fairly well, I understand. Yeah, I mean, again, this being a very tech-heavy city, there's a lot of investment in that sort of telecom, internet feed. I actually live in a building that has a fiber connection that's somewhat common in some of the larger buildings in this area. So in terms of my signal, it's pretty good. My company's VPN has been pretty good and stable. Yeah, I mean, in terms of, I can't say that I've heard of many, like you mentioned that even when it's a good day, we hear about major outages. I can't say that I've heard of any major outages coming out of any of the major websites or anything. I don't know if it's just I haven't noticed or, or it's not been happening. Um, probably there's a trade-off too with people not in office buildings and now at their homes and maybe it spreads out the, the pressure a little bit even though you don't have increased usage. Um, it's curious because you're right I and mean, I don't think I've heard of any major outages and you would expect that. I mean most of the conflict, most of the conspiracy, excuse me, the controversy I've heard is things like that I found out that Zoom meetings print out all of the private DMs that happen during a, a video chat at the end. And not only that, but there's absolutely no security and you can simply type in a random number and find someone's Zoom meeting, which I thought was pretty funny. There was apparently a culture of people going around and Zoom crashing, just entering in random numbers into the Zoom client to see if they could find an interesting meeting and then just take it over. Which I thought was kind of funny. And this has, as far as I can tell, hit locally here. My employer does use Zoom, unfortunately and they have had randoms show up and they had to implement a policy of like having multiple rooms where you, you join the, the first room and then you have to like somehow identify yourself as one of the students and if you don't do that even if you are one of the students the staff just completely ignore you and so this is this like, is literally this is literally like 1999 IRC server splits <laughs> Isn't that what they used to do? They'd make a new channel and everyone would have to join the new channel and oh my god. Yeah, Everything exactly. Back full circle, doesn't it? Like we've already solved this problem, people. How are we still having this problem? <laughs> All right. And so but you're saying though that you haven't seen too many crises as far as outages and that is concerned. Another way that that may be happening is that there's also while there's more pressure being put on the pressure points as far as video conferencing and bandwidth are concerned. There's also not as many people with their hands playing with equipment, basically. And there's fewer changes. I know Google, for a while, stopped releasing new versions of its web browser. That's just kind of one example of a big project where they just stopped releasing software updates unless it's a really big, important change. Because everyone knows that it's kind of like you don't push changes to production on Friday. Well, every day is a Friday <laughs> at this point. Yeah. So yeah. unless it's important, people know that the, the resources are just not available. But now back to you, Richard. What has your experience been as far as working from home? Well, as we were discussing earlier, uh, I think my big challenge seems to be communication with uh, lots of web meetings, lots of phone calls over Teams, and a lot of calls over over Zoom and that sort of thing. It's been quite a hassle for me because I've got like some decent recording equipment and I've been trying to route my calls through there as opposed to my like $20 wireless headset, which seems to be the only thing that's working with my phone now. <laughs> so it's been that's probably why it sounds like absolute garbage. But yeah, I don't know. It's uh, the other issue is trying to like provide technical support when that's not really the nature of my job. But to try to provide technical support for thirty some people working from home. Some of them who may or may not be able to tell the difference between a remote desktop and you know, their actual desktop. So, you know, so it's so, uh, less so to give some context chaos. to the world. Richard is a very technically inclined person. He has been involved with computers longer than I have. Has I don't even how many computers. <laughs> Are there in your house? Or a better question: How many too hard many, drives? Too many. Have? How many hard drives? Yeah. Um, I mean, one, the one server's got twenty hooked into it right now, but <laughs> so more than there's quite a few hard drives. Yeah, more than you're able to count on a uh, three-second thought. So again, th this is a, a person who is very technically inclined and is got the skills there. And even then, just the, the setup of things like a video call, there are technical difficulties that happen and you're able to troubleshoot them and that's, that's great, but they still hit you, right? And so the normal person who doesn't have a 20-year background of trying to pick apart technical problems they're going to run into this wall of, I don't know what to do, and I don't know who to turn to. And especially if it's their communications platform that allows them to communicate with the outside world, it's kind of a really big hit for them to take right now. 
So, yeah. if I might point out, I mean, sometimes there's things you can't control either. I mean, the wire coming into your house is owned by someone else, and if there's something going on with that or on their end, there's only so much you can do. And if you call someone, you know, you're going to be on the phone for two hours trying to find the person who knows how to fix it. And that's just life, I mean, when you deal with the telcos, as it were. You can't control that, and especially sometimes when you've got, like, you know, I know if you go through cable for your internet, you've got to have a box that they technically own that they put in your house that you can't really do anything with. So, so I have heard yeah. that you, could be, you could be brilliant and you still can't control what Rogers or whoever does. Yeah. Well, it's also interesting, the, the variety of hardware that you may be dealing with. Like, for example, I've got a laptop that has a Bluetooth connection and, you know, using a wireless Bluetooth headset, but, like, Co-workers elsewhere, you know, some of them are using corporate supplied computers. Some people might be using a Mac. Someone may out there be trying to run this off of a Linux machine. Uh, some desktops, different laptops, different configurations, and it's uh, different sorts of hardware that you've got to kind of contend with and I just sort of hope everything comes together in the end. So as far as... The, the frustrations are kind of building, at least here in Saskatchewan, and I've heard in the States as well, and Keith, you can correct me on that, as far as because everyone has been trying to get these the work that they'd normally be doing at home done, these Zoom meetings that are not as efficient as, for example, just text-based communication for a lot of things, IRC would probably improve the lives of millions of people had they known about it. But unfortunately, it's not the tool that everyone knows. It's not the tool that everyone uses. So the business is taking place in these platforms. And there's increasing pressure on politicians, on workplaces to basically get back to a normal. And so as far as a getting back to a normal goes, what is your perspective? We'll start with Keith and then kind of go in the opposite direction. Uh, do you see, Seattle was hit earlier than the rest of North America as far as COVID is concerned. Is there an yes. understanding that this isn't going anywhere? Like what? what is the call for bringing things back to normal like over there? Well, I think as you pointed out, I mean, the fact that the first confirmed COVID-19 death in the United States, it was actually five miles from where I'm currently sitting. So I think that has a certain wake-up call for the local community that this is serious. I mean, it's literally happened, started in our backyard. And it being such a, especially in the past 20 years or so, being such a technology-oriented community, I think that people are a little bit more savvy about what can be done and what can't be done. I don't, I'm sure there have been, I have heard that in the state capital, which is about 100 now, about 50 miles from here, there have been some people that have come out to protest the state shutdowns and county shutdowns. The thing about the state of Washington is that it's, there's this big mountain range that runs down the middle, and it's literally two different, almost countries on either side of those mountains. So you have a lot of people on the west side of the mountains who, I don't want to say they get it, but they're more sympathetic to when government needs to do something to keep us safe, whereas the other side of the mountains is much more they don't like the state government they feel underserved by it and then when it comes out that they feel that they can't go to work they're going to protest but i feel like in this actual area i haven't seen that many people or heard of that many people that have been that upset about it i think the benefit of though is that the fact that a lot of us are technology workers for better or for worse is that and i mean this is kind of unfair to people who don't work in our field but we actually can mostly get on with business as usual because we're pretty well connected in terms of telecommunications and also have a good amount of technological savvy in general. But I was thinking the only issue that I think that I've had that was involved with working from home at my company was, or in my milieu, was that there was a system we couldn't connect to unless we were actually in the office building. And we ended up finding a way around that, but it was an interest. Our VPN was not included in that access, so we actually found a way around that with a remote desktop. But it's funny, the things you don't even notice is a problem until everyone's working from home. Yeah, so back to uh, Richard. Now... Unfortunately, here in Saskatchewan, we don't have this barrier between the people who want the province to basically open back up again and the rest of us. <laughs> and it's just wide open. You don't have any mountain ranges in Saskatchewan. Yeah. So as, as far as your experience goes, like there's definitely people out and about right now in Saskatoon. But what have you seen as far as wanting to return to a sense of normalcy? What, uh, there was a protest a uh, couple of days ago, maybe last week even, uh, at City Hall in Saskatoon here. I didn't attend because I have, I have 
have to work, and I certainly do not agree with what they're protesting. You have it would be very interesting to uh, have seen the numbers. I haven't heard any reports of numbers of people that actually attended this, but very much like in the U.S., so they have their reopen whatever their state is uh, protest, and uh, then like three days later, we have our protest here. And I don't know. Like it's. I think there's certainly a, a pressure here of people wanting to return to normal because. When this hit, I, I don't think we were doing particularly well to begin with. But and then to just stop the economy is certainly putting a lot of pressure on a lot of people. Like Keith had said, a lot of people don't have jobs that involve a lot of technology. So like if you're a, a roofer or a scaffolder or a plumber or whatever, uh, there's not a lot of work. And even if there was, do you necessarily want to be going out into people's homes and offices to conduct a lot of this work, not knowing who or what you may be exposed to. I guess the Premier recently had opened uh, or had made an announcement about an announcement, and then he made another announcement uh, where he uh, spoke of a, a plan to reopen uh, Saskatchewan, and I guess that's sort of the trend on Twitter. So apparently May 4th is the date where things start to return to normal, perhaps uh, maybe facilitate the second wave of infections, but I guess history will see at the end of it all. And so, Larry, what is your perspective on the reopening here? I think it's, to me, it seems a little rushed what they're doing. Like, there's a lot of things that haven't been addressed prior to them going with this phase plan that the provincial government wants to roll out for reopening the province. Issues with uh, homeless people in the province, they didn't. Re they still haven't developed like a good plan on that. Um, and I'm, I'm just going to pause here for a sec because somebody made a really good point that I, I think made, there was an interview or something a couple of years back of our premier here in Saskatchewan of like, what are your favorite things to do? And it was like boating, uh, fishing, and there was like a list of like three or four things that were his favorite things to do. And while there's a lot of outcry, both in Saskatoon and I'm sure in Regina, as far as the homeless situation goes, there hasn't really been all that much action, especially on the provincial level, on that. But there has been, as part of the plan you've mentioned, uh, boating, fishing, and basically a, a who's who and what's what of on the list of our premier's favorite well, things has all been oh, yeah. re-legalized yeah. as far as yeah. the very first step as getting back to a, quote, sense of normal. And so I just found that interesting that there's definitely a conscious or unconscious difference between the treatment of a problem like almost people actually getting a infectious disease and spreading it back to the general public and things that the premier personally enjoys. But anyway, continue on. Yeah, like you said, it's like uh, golfing was one of the things that are going to be like one of the top things that's currently going to restart. And then in phase two, you're going to see like hairstylists and stuff. I'm um, going to be opening some things up there. Another thing is like in indigenous communities, they are already have like very poor levels of uh, infrastructure. And there hasn't been like a, a good addressing of that from the federal and the provincial levels of government on assisting on that. Uh, the new cases, like our cases aren't going down to zero. We did have some new cases actually open up. But a number of them actually in northern Saskatchewan, and so that's, and once again, that's one of the places in the province that is poorly served by infrastructure and not as well-to-do communities up there as well. Yet we are going full steam ahead like with this, which is, which is concerning to see something like that where it should be like, okay, maybe you want to start out maybe with phase one and maybe see where it goes with that. Or a better approach would be maybe like social distancing in different communities. Okay, we're going to try lessening the restrictions maybe in one area while we lock it down in another and see how things do there. Maybe like a rolling social distancing or something like that. Rather than, we're opening for business, entire province, let's do this. Yeah. Rather than you know, taking a more measured approach at it. I understand, yes, you know, I am one of the fortunate ones. I can work from home. I'm still employed, but there are a lot of people that can't do what I do. And I understand that they are going through like financial difficulties. And But the priority should be public health. That's a priority we should be looking at because that is a long-term economic effect. If you don't address public health properly, you are going to be causing all sorts of problems. You are going to be threatening people's health. You're going to threaten the economy if you rush things too quickly. So, so one of the things you pointed out was the part about the, the outbreak in the north. And so one of the outbreaks that's happening in Saskatchewan right now 
is at a place called the Confederation Inn here oh. in Saskatoon. And what the Confederation Inn is, is a stopping point for people from Northern Reserves. And Lavash was, I think, one of the ones that was mentioned in the news. I don't know the, the full list of all the various nations that have a stop-off point there. But there is travel and when people come into the city, that is where they stay. And it is at this inn that also has beds set up on a normal day for medical situations that arise so that their elders or whoever is sick and needing medical attention, they can actually get medical attention right within the inn itself normally. And so this is the context of the outbreak there, that these old, already sick people, they're the ones who are, have been exposed to COVID-19 this week. And... And here's the important part. They're counted as being cases in northern Saskatchewan. Even though they are physically in Saskatoon, because of that's where they came from, and because of, for whatever reason, the rules of counting where the infections are, they are currently counting it as a northern case, which kind of makes me wonder how many cases are there actually in the north. Because if all of the supposed cases are in places like PA, Saskatoon, maybe... North Battleford or something like that. That means a different kind of policy response is called for, right? Where I can't remember if it was Manitoba or Saskatchewan, but they one of the two provinces started closing off travel to the north of their province and basically erecting something like those mountains to prevent people from traveling. Whereas if COVID is already in the north, that isn't as important, right? Mm, yeah. So it's like, it's not, we don't know the full scope of this. It's uh, like you're saying. And now we're also seeing like a lessening of the number of testing. The provincial government saying that they are going to be increasing testing like for COVID-19. They're promising to do that, but they haven't announced any details of exactly how they're going to be doing that. I would say, you know, you should be increasing the testing before you even roll out any sort of plan, rather than the, you're seeing like the number of testing likes going down. And like you're saying, oh, it's like isolated. Like we don't know how big this impact is going to be. The the cases that could happen, the the pockets of an infection that occur. Uh, like if you're not taking care of communities properly, and and you're opening up different areas like in Saskatchewan and lessening those restrictions those pockets are going to be it's going to be people are going to be like getting through it's it's not going to catch everybody so back to keith now two questions on that first of all how is the testing going in in seattle or, or do have you heard much on that side I've, I've heard there are places i don't know if seattle's one of them where they've ordered and been shipped some fake or non-working tests and there's problems sourcing legitimate tests and then the other question on top of that is have you heard anything as far as the local American Indians and their experience with it, or is that kind of like not the kind of news that reaches uh, people? Out there? I think I think you got it right at the end there. It's not the kind of news that reaches people, and, and you'd be surprised. I mean, because there is a fair amount of there are a number of Native tribes with some amount of notability that people are familiar with, and, and they're not even well, relatively speaking. I don't think they're as marginalized here as they are in other places and other states. But it's definitely a concern that I've heard, but I don't know that there's anything been specifically done to help them. And in terms of tests, I haven't heard anything negative. I mean, we I think we're a little bit blessed to have a pretty decent, uh, uh, at least medical industry, for lack of a better word, in this area. I haven't heard anything about tests. I know we've done a number of things, like we've built some, or we've bought some places to service quarantine centers. And as far as I know, testing is, is okay. I don't know about faulty tests, though. I did hear that. Not only did some states get faulty tests, but some states were supposed to get tests and they got hijacked by the federal government to be sent somewhere else, which I thought was... Or I think there was a shipment going to Mexico that the U.S. intercepted and had it sent to New York or something like that, which... Some people are referring to as the return of imperial piracy, which isn't entirely inaccurate. Yeah, I think we've been pretty proactive in Washington to actually have a good set of policies about don't go outside, work from home, keep your businesses closed. Or, they, you know, a lot of businesses are still open, but they're, like, I know there's restaurants that are they're just doing delivery and takeout, which, I mean, for a bar, that doesn't work so well, but for a restaurant, it works okay. But I know that still the restaurants are struggling because they made it just temporarily legal to actually deliver alcoholic mixed drinks, which I thought was quite interesting. It's kind of like the depression was a major factor in overturning prohibition in the United States, so it kind of reminds me of that, like, oh, we're all struggling, so let's make alcohol easier to get. Not that I'm complaining, but it is a thing. For sure, and I think I've heard similar things here, at least in Ontario, I think they started loosening the regulations of delivery of alcohol, so I think that's going on here as well, I'm not 100% sure mm-hmm. on that. But you mentioned the quarantine centers, so is there quarantine centers set up there, and is it like a, I've seen some where it's like just sort of tense outside of the, the hospital, but 
Is it a little uh, bit more organized there, or has it been needed? Or It's probably up to the county level, and that's kind of a whole other enchilada, but I know that in this county, there was a motel that the county bought. It was a vacant motel that was being up for sale, and the county actually bought it, and we're housing confirmed cases of COVID-19 there. I don't know. I'm sure there's been a few others. There have been some. I think there may be, some, I want to say, no, I don't want to speculate, but I think there's been other things like maybe university dorms or hospital hotels or something like that that have expanded their capacity to hold people for quarantine. It's not widespread. I mean, I don't know where the nearest one is to me, but I know that's been a thing that the county has looked into, and I believe the state as well. I mean, I think in general, this state is, I think the West Coast in general has got a pretty good handle on the right things to do right now. And yeah, I'm sure there's definitely pockets of each state where there's people that are don't know what the big deal is, don't see the point. People are dying from the regular flu. Why are we freaking out? But I think, honestly, it's probably one of the least of our worries right now. I think the big worry is that it's going to have a permanent impact on a lot of the growth that we've had in this area. And we've already seen the pressures that come with you know, rising rents and things of that nature. We're going to see that more with businesses getting priced out or unable to reopen. And that's going to be a put a downward pressure on the whole economy. And I kind of wonder what will happen there in terms of, especially since Washington, I think the state may have the highest or one of the highest minimum wages in the country. And I could imagine, unfortunately, there may be downward pressure on that. As a result, if we can't get things mostly back to something close to up and running before a couple of months out. I feel like it would be really nice, and it's not, it sounds kind of like a centralized control command economy, but if we could literally put the entire economy on pause, and no rent, no mortgage, no loan payments, no anything, just for a couple of months, like would be like it would just be fine. Like we'd be better off. I mean, yeah, there'd be maintenance costs and whatever, but it's like, that's not what we're doing. We're like, we're closing a lot of things, and we're restricting incomes and we're throwing money at a few people and it's it's not enough we're going to end up in a mess no matter what we do because we kind of do it halfway i don't feel like we really take it as seriously as we should as a nation well also i know the source that i got it from is gonna shock all three of you probably but the daily stormer today actually made an interesting point which was the a lot of the things that are closed right now are the small businesses the mom and pop stores businesses that are not able to just up and rig up a way to to have social distancing within the store uh, at least here uh, again keith you can kind of correct me as far as whether as true in the states but things like walmart have managed to stay open bigger centers although not as many people are allowed in the store your, your costcos your your big warehouse stores the like here yard sales are forbidden all these small businesses are closed but the big large corporations are still operating a lot of them enough of them anyway and so it seems like there's in addition to the shock that the both the us and the canadian and the rest of the world economy are getting right now one of the things that's happening is a kind of a transition of power from the small businesses to the large businesses and the mega corporations that it's awfully suspicious that that is part of the policy response. Yeah, what? and that's a good point. And I don't know how much of that is coincidence and how much of that is deliberate. I'm thinking in particular, I know a couple of restaurants that are locally owned, and that's more or less as a mom and pop. And, you know, they're allowed to stay open with restrictions. I think you're right, though. I mean, I think the thing is a lot of small businesses are going into things that are a little bit on the unnecessary side. You know, I'm thinking little boutique shops, antique shops, that kind of thing. You know, nobody really needs an 1897 Edison in phonograph right now or whatever but a lot of places that are open in particular marijuana stores in washington have been deemed essential and are allowed to remain open that all of them are small businesses because there's no real way for a large corporation to even get involved in that funnily enough okay. so it's, it's them, interesting i think time. you're they'll, right they'll get there i'm sure <laughs> But, uh, well, yes, I know. I mean, but it's. I mean, it's been a while. I mean, I think we've had it legal in the state for I want to say six to eight years, or at least five, six years. And uh, I, there hasn't really been that. And I think the impediment is that because the way that the laws work, it's kind of a technicality. So what happens is that it's still illegal. So the federal government technically only has authority over things that happen between states. So if it happens only within a state, they have a lot less authority. That's kind of how the legalization of marijuana is getting by in the U.S because it's still federal illegally. Right. So if you were a business that had a store in Washington State, and I mean, it could be in Vancouver, down by the, by Vancouver, Washington, down by the border of Oregon, and another store across the Columbia in Portland, and you own both of those, then the DEA would have shut you down in a week. 
even though you're like five miles from each other. So, and even like the grill operations have to be within the state. You can't like grow it in Washington and send it to Oregon because that would be better. So I think that's big impediment is that you can't, I mean, yeah, you could have a local company that got big and bought a lot of them. And I think there's a few of those that they're franchising. They're still fairly small businesses. But I think it's a more matter of the, you're right, the businesses that tend to be small businesses are things that are generally not necessities. It's, you know, things like boutique shops and consignment stores and things like that. It's a good point. So back to Richard. Now, as far as both the impact on small business and kind of what you see on that, as well as the possible way of approaching this in terms of a centralized response, what, what is your kind of take on that? Approaching as a centralized response. Um, I do like the idea that we could like put everything on hold, um, you know, no mortgage, no rent, no, you know, anything. And I'm going to pause there actually for a second. So you are actually a landlord saying this, right? Uh, yes. So it's actually kind of important to note that when a landlord is outright saying, yes, we should just have a pause on the rent kind of globally or at least nationally. Well, I mean, my understanding, to be fair, is I mean, there's other arguments, but a lot of the arguments against rent freeze is that landlords have still have to pay their mortgages on the properties they're renting, to which I say, well, then we should stop the mortgages too. I mean, that would solve that argument. But Well, exactly. That's kind of my perspective is that if we could, if it's no mortgages, no loan payments, no rent collection, etc., basically that means that as far as landlords would go, it would be you know, just maintenance costs that they would have to incur. And I mean, that comparatively speaking, in my mind, would be, be much less or much smaller than you know, than having to incur the mortgage and everything else at the same time. I guess in a broad economic sense, I guess they're starting to reopen the, the province with this. I do think that uh, the provincial response is perhaps a little bit early. Didn't really put a whole lot of thought into it. A lot of, for example, they are going to allow dental clinics to uh, resume service to their clientele. Uh, I guess the uh, shortcoming on that is, say, you're a dental hygienist and you can go back to work on May 4th when everything opens up. But there was no thought given to child care. So, you know, you can have parents who may be going into work because they're working in a medical profession or some other facility that's now open, uh, effective May 4th, but the child care doesn't open till a much later phase, so now they have nowhere to put their kids while they have to go to work or while they go back to work. I think that there should be some, a little bit more thought and put in towards this, uh, this reopening plan. That's interesting, actually, because I didn't know that childcare was shut down in a lot of places. I know, and my fiance is actually works in a preschool, and she's still been working. She's been on reduced hours up for the past couple of weeks, but they hear that, that was something they considered essential. Now, of course, it turns out that a lot of parents pull their kids from daycare anyway, so that's <laughs> reduced the demand of it. But that's interesting. It does seem like that would be something you would think you would need if people were going to go back to work and need somewhere to put their kids. Especially with schools, I know in Washington the school years, they said, I get it, they're not going to go back to school this year. I and mean, in a lot of places, schools are still closed, so it's just more a bigger issue for older kids. Well, talking about like dental care, like dentists opening up, from what I understand, there are challenges associated with that, that they don't know if they're, if all the dentists are going to be able to open like on May the 4th, which is the target date for that to happen. Due to the lack of PPE, like personal protective equipment, there's yeah. not enough that to go around. And this is something that dentists are concerned about, that they won't be able to access that in order to open up their offices. And then they're asking for this to uh, also for other businesses like the retail of stores that are going to be opening up in phase two, they're asking them to use DPE as well. We already have a shortage of that, like with our medical workers. The dental offices are going to have problems with this, and then the retail outlets are going to have are going to have problems as well. So that's another big gaping problem that I see is you really need to fix that before you start ruling anything out. Well, and for example, it's like they're opening up retail business such as hairdressers and that sort of thing, barber shops. And they're like, well, you can reopen provided you maintain proper social distancing. And it, yeah, I'm trying to figure out how a hairdresser is going to remain socially distanced <laughs> from their clientele given the nature of the work. So. 
Um, but yeah, it's not like those. TV, there's just a practical reality that needs to be met that, like, I don't think anyone has really put much thought in uh, with their announcement. Like, I guess all the signs coming out of the protests in the States where people are crying for a haircut. And maybe put some pressure on, on our government to include them, but they're also trying to balance the, the reality of a pandemic and calling for social distancing. So I, I don't know, like, do you put a, is there some sort of, like, scissors on some sort of pole or you can like, try to cut someone's hair using using that or like tape a razor to a broomstick or well I, I don't know what that's supposed to look like. You could probably do like the, uh, the news people with their hockey sticks, eh? There you go, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, now as far as the national response in the States goes, I know it's hard to keep up with the dumpster fire <laughs> a little bit yeah. uh, on a good day. But a lot of distraction it, there too. <laughs> as far as, I'll start with Richard actually. Your perspective and like notable things you've seen from the federal side in the U.S. Because, I mean, anything they do there is going to impact us anyway. But what has been your view of what's been going on? Well, I mean, I think that it's just in terms of numbers, you've got a country that is 4.25% of the global population. And they have almost 33% of the cases worldwide for infection. I mean, I think that there was certainly part of it, I think, is sort of a mentality thing. Like, I think a lot of people, as, as you can see through these protests, seem to think that their individual personal liberty trumps the collective good of society. And, I mean, I guess that may have been a contributing factor to these high numbers. Uh, perhaps private health care could be another issue with that. My understanding is that I think about 70% of the people who were supposed to be receiving checks for unemployment benefits haven't actually received uh, their checks. And uh, my understanding as well is that check processing had been delayed because I guess some, I guess the people were getting 1200 bucks or something like that. Trump wanted yeah. to put his name in the memo line, uh, which basically meant they had to rewrite the entire check pr processing software yeah, uh, to incorporate that which, of course, institutes delays. So, I don't know, it seems like the whole, the system is kind of falling apart, and I don't know if it's falling apart or if it was just broken to begin with. <laughs> I think it's always been broken, to be honest. I mean, and firstly, this is not the kind of thing that where the federal government is even typically designed for, although it was done in the past, I want to say in, like, 2000 and two or three or somewhere, they did actually put out a, maybe it was 2000, uh, actually 2001, where they put out a, it was actually a, a free fund check that went out to everyone in the country. Yeah, the 1200 thing is interesting because everything depends on what you did last year for taxes and how you, if you got a refund and how you got the refund, because some people already have their money, because if you had yourself set up to receive your previous refund by direct deposit into your bank, that went without a hitch. But people who didn't do that, who, you know, had a check sent to them or whatever, they're the ones waiting for a check. And yeah, they're on the hook because they keep delaying the process. And, and actually, it's interesting because, I mean, I know in Canada, I believe every single Canadian or every single Canadian adult got $2,000 and it was out like, mm -hmm. you know, in a week. Okay, uh, I guess I heard wrong. No. In the U.S., it's not 1200 for everyone. It's actually 1200 if you made under a certain amount, and then it reduces through your last year's income to another amount, and then if you make over that, you don't get anything. So there's a lot of people, especially in this area, who didn't actually get a check because of the nature of the standard of living here. We already get paid more than that amount, so it's kind of I'm like, that's great that people are getting money. I mean, I'm not, but, you know, I guess I don't need it as much, but still, gee, if, if, let's not pretend like we're giving it to everyone. So, um, in the meanwhile, we do have another challenger has entered the room. I saw that. Uh, so, Adam uh, has been a guest on the show before. So, uh, Larry, Keith, and Richard. Uh, you may note there is Adam here. So, Adam, uh, have you been able to listen to any of the show at all so far, or is this right out of the middle? I, uh, I just got on during that last set of comments there. I know, Larry, I'm not sure if we know uh, Keith. Online before. Oh, but yeah, the Canada CERB program that they started, what they did was they made the program temporary, you know, to place the EI person. And what their kind of uh, thought on it was is that we don't have the manpower or resources to really sort out who's qualified or not qualified. So we're going to call it taxable income. It's going to be automatically approved. And if, if you're getting it, like if you're still working and you shouldn't have got it, 
they'll come back after you and get it back. So there's a website under the Canadian government. I put it on my Facebook wall there the other day. It's got like an EI dash reports at the end of it. So far, they got 6.82 million unique applications out of like nine point some million total. And they've paid out $21.2 billion already. So it is kind of crazy. Uh, it might not be uh, big numbers for an American who sees trillions of dollars getting wasted left, right, and center all the time. But in this case, there is a certain number of months that Canada could go before this country is going to totally default and have a revolution. Because that's a pretty big number for everybody. So, Keith, do you have any response on that? Yeah, I don't see one in mind if the government wasted a bit more money on like the people rather than blowing things up or giving handouts to people that really, really, I mean, and I see this when I'm, again, about four miles away from the two richest people on the planet, that, you know, it'd be nice if we could waste a little bit more money on the actual American people, the everyday person than the super rich and the large corporations and also on blowing people up. Yeah, but I mean, I think that people are already looking at the money that we've already spent. And the funny thing is that you mentioned that, yeah, we had this $2 trillion benefit and included this, like, something like 500 billion for small businesses and it turns out that like only a couple percent of small businesses could even get the money before it ran out and a lot of them weren't even small businesses so it's like and it's funny because there was actually in the law that proved that stimulus there was supposed to be someone who was making sure the money was going to the right places and within two days that person was fired so that says a lot about where the priorities are I think for sure so for Adam the last question for the night is as far as what you've seen in the US federal side. There's a lot of things going on in the federal side and their reaction to COVID and the economic crisis and the et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But as far as notable things that you've seen this week, is there anything that sticks out for you? Well, this week I'm just trying to watch. It sort of seems like the tone has changed to reopening. I saw another $454 billion subsidy stimulus thing that was signed off it looks like yesterday so there's more money being tossed around some places are coming back and there's sort of this desperate need to get the economy rolling again before it collapses and everybody starves to death because you got that's kind of the uh, Jekyll and Hyde situation that you got going on here you got a pandemic that's going crazy and you've got a an economic system that could fail and falter uh, pretty quick and easy if this goes on long enough and uh, if that happens it'll be civil unrest revolution style so it's kind of getting into an ugly spot now i mean a month or two we could probably handle being shut down for have a great big national holiday together but beyond mm -hmm. that you got people that are running out of money running out of the ability to feed themselves and <laughs> you're cutting up there a little bit but as far as keith and again you're kind of closer to the uh, what's going on on this one do you have any response on that I guess there's a point there where there's two options, right? We either restore the economic system that we have to a state where it can, I guess, kind of work, mostly work, or do we change the system to one that isn't dependent on people risking their lives to make sure everyone, you know what I mean? Like, I guess that that's the real option. We can either return things and open things back up so that everyone can go back to making money, or maybe we can look a little bit differently at what's really important. And I guess it's, it's just a valid question either way. Is either we return things to the way they were and risk a potentially more damage or we change the way we do things. And I think a lot of people are talking about that. I think there have been people on TV lately that have said, you know, is this, do we want to go back to the way things were knowing what we're going through now and knowing the struggle that we face? Or is it possible that we can change it just a little bit to make it a bit more, make our society more resilient? That'd be my thought on that. Because I understand the pressure that people aren't getting paid. And like, I even have taken a salary cut. My fiance has had hours reductions. So it's, it's, it's happened to a lot of people. And then, of course, rent's not going down. So what are we going to do. So it's a real fear, and I think that you have to find, there's multiple ways to resolve that fear and that problem, and, and I think we have an opportunity to make a choice. And that's all. And it looks like Adam yeah. was jumping at the bit to say something there. <laughs> Well, resilience can come through savings. That's the big culture problem. We have a culture that 
loads up on debts, loads up on payments until they're maxed out. Can I buy that house and that truck and that RV and that whatever else and then go on a trip or here or there until they get their debt obligations maxed out where they're struggling to make their payments every paycheck and that's how people have come to live. If people instead lived a little bit more humble and had a little bit of money saved away so that when something like this happened, they weren't in trouble, they could last for a while, it'd be a much different world. But you take a look at the total indebtedness of the population and those are all not 100% personal choices. I'll give them some leeway that some people don't make a lot of money or struggle with that. But the percentage of people that <laughs> You're cutting out again, Adam. But I think we got that. But in the meanwhile, uh, Larry. So yeah, as I mean, far as the, it's not wrong. I mean, it's true that people aren't. I mean, even the major companies clearly haven't been saving up because they're the ones most desperate for bailouts. But an interesting thing is, if everyone starts doing that. Let's say everyone stops spending on luxuries. Everyone starts saving their money, pays off their debt. You know what they call that? It's called a recession because. <laughs> The economy is dependent on people doing that. I had a friend say back in like the 19, mid 90s recession, I believe there was, a friend said, the reason we're having a recession is because people stopped living beyond their means. And I said, what? Like, do you, what's the implication of that fact? Like, people have to live beyond their means for the economy to continue growing in a way that, you know what I mean? So it's, it's kind of becomes a double edged sword. I mean, yeah, that's right. People should be saving more. I totally agree. But then when we do that, it's called a recession because now we're buying less stuff. So that's giving less money to companies that sell that stuff and it becomes a, a vicious circle. It's unfortunate and that's why I wonder if there's a way to, to short circuit the vicious circle there and, and yeah, go to a point where we're saving, we're stable, we're investing in each other if we have to and maybe not with it beyond our means but have the economy not collapse as a result. So back to Larry, now, as both on, on terms of this idea of recession as savings and as well, anything notable you've seen as far as the federal level of the U.S. is concerned this past week, uh, that's of note and your response to that. Well, I think it's great that the government's trying to help people out, but the, the system that they had, it's like a patchwork assistance system that they had with CERB and everything. What is brought forward is that we should have like a basic income program for everyone. Uh, like a national program like that would be great, simplify uh, the whole system. And I have to agree that the economy that we have, it's based on debt. Banks operate on debt. It's a system f that functions on debt. So we have actually, what's happening like with, with COVID-19 is laying bare the problems with our current economic system. It has deep, deep flaws in it. And it's a system that really needs to change. Functioning on debt and functioning on consumption is going to destroy us eventually. It's going to destroy the planet and our economic system. And this is showing us that we need to change. And I don't think we're going to take lessons from this, that our governments are going to learn that the economic system that we have right now needs to change, that we need to get away from giving all the power to the banks and to large corporations. And there should be more uh, public good of helping people and raising people up and not a system where you're just going to be digging yourself a hole. It's kind of telling. I mean, when you look at what happens when there is a downturn in the economy, any country with a central bank, first thing they do is they cut interest rates. Why do they cut interest rates? They cut interest rates so that banks will take on less risk so that they will loan more money out, which is more debt. And that's because that's what we figure drives the economy is banks get money off of, you know, no banks don't get money off the savings accounts. They get money off of loans. That's how they make their income. So it's telling that we look at that and we say, well, if we make the interest rates lower, and we're going to see that again, I mean, we're going to end up with negative interest rates pretty soon in the U.S. because I'm already reading that the banks are going to start tightening their uh, loan requirements. It's going to get more stricter. And that's a bad sign because that means that as you have that less debt, you have less expenditure, you have less home sales, you'll have less so forth and so on. So. It's, yeah, it's, but I mean, you're right. I mean, that's kind of where we make our money right now as an economy is, is in debt and interest on debt. And I don't know, I think that's one of the things that we need to figure out a, a way to solve. How do we base things on that method of raising money? And is there another way to do it to keep things stable? I'd like that. All right, so we are getting near to the end here. So I'll, I'll start with Adam. Now that you have the world's attention and the attention of the, the other three, uh, is there anything you'd like to get across in the last uh, little bit here? 
I just want people to save a little more money and do what they need to do to be productive and happy and keep themselves safe. That's the main thing. Keep yourself happy, productive, and safe, and don't get turned into too much of a debt slave here because that's really what allows them to control you. Good ending note on that. Uh, Richard, same question to you. Is, is there something or anything you'd like to get through to the world and to the rest of us? Now that you have the world's attention. Well, I think uh, now is a good opportunity for us to uh, take another look at our society and how we operate as a society, our relationships between each other, as well as the uh, larger institutions of uh, the financial sector and the government, and uh, you know maybe take a look at that relationship and see what's working and what is not. It's just very interesting as we now suddenly, when a lot of office work had always been done in an office and a lot of people have had childcare requirements and some of them wanted to work home, maybe they have to look after uh, a sick loved one or something like that prior to the pandemic. And they were told, no, you have to show up to work every day and put in your eight hours. Well, now suddenly we have offices all over the country working from home. So now we've got this opportunity in front of us where we can say, well, we did it during the pandemic. I want to do it after the pandemic. Why shouldn't I be allowed to do it after the pandemic if I've shown that I can be productive and, I guess, for the sake of the employer, profitable and what have you. A lot of people with disabilities aren't, weren't able to work because of mobility issues or transportation issues or other issues that they may face as a result of a disability. But you set them up in a home office and they log in every morning remotely. They can, they can work just as well as any other able-bodied person and I think we should be taking a good hard look at how we do this and how we operate our society with no in regards to that. Alright, and uh, Larry, is there anything you'd like to get across to the world? Well, I would like to say this is it's terrible that COVID-19 has hit the world like it has and taken so many lives, but this is it is actually showing us that we do need to change and we need to be better prepared. When it comes to like the healthcare systems, we need to be better prepared. Like we should be, uh, have like a better plan in place for cooperation like internationally when things like this hit. But we need to have a more robust economic system to address issues like this when it occurs. And it's showing that there are deep, deep problems that we have that need to be worked out both on a local level, uh, a national level, and an international level, we need to be doing those things. And I'm hoping that the leaders that we have are up to that challenge, that we need to reimagine like how we run an economy, how we, we help people, uh, that we need to have in place. The, the focus should be on individuals and small businesses, not large corporations and the wealthy. And that seems to be the focus now is helping them uh, like that was what the focus was that's changed a little bit more and that we're focusing more on helping individuals when this hit with the pandemic and i'm hoping that that will translate forward into something that we will see continuing that we won't flip the switch and go okay now we're going to be focusing more on the large corporations and the wealthy and helping them out we don't care so much about what's happening with individuals and keeping them afloat and making sure that they keep their homes and they keep and are able to provide for their families and well these are things that I hope we're going to take from this. And don't rush things. Listen to the experts. Listen to the health professionals. Don't let decisions be motivated by purely by politics. That is a frightening thing. Those are the things, my last thoughts anyways, is the things that we should be focusing on and being concerned about. Excellent. Thanks for that. And Keith, uh, I guess in addition to the, that question as well, just as a side note, do you find that at the national level local to you, do you see that kind of leadership and example being acted on? And then other than that, um, do you have any last thoughts on that you'd like to get across to the world? So to your question. point about local and national leadership, I would say local yes and national no. And there's been an increasing talk lately actually of, I mean, the, the three western states recently agreed on a tri-state pact to work together on the COVID-19 response, and there's a similar one in the Northeast. So we're seeing these lines that we've been talking about for a good, I don't know, 20 years, actually starting to be drawn, and I think a lot of people are wondering where that's going to go. But to the bigger question, I mean, to echo to what everyone said, I mean, we are. this is a great opportunity. Every cloud is a silver lining. Right now, we are at a position in time where it's a good opportunity for us to think about is there a way we can change our economic posture in a way 
that will make it stronger and more beneficial. And to Adam's point, that includes at a personal level as well as to a more broader community, state, province, national, worldwide level. You know, how do we support each other? How do we also make sure we are capable of supporting others? And we have that chance right now to make a decision that could change things for some time. And the question is, will we make a decision and what decision will that be? And will we stick to it? We have that. That's up to us. That's up to all of us to decide. Awesome. So thank you all four of you for joining in this week. And just a reminder to the those of you who are listening, this is a donation-supported podcast. <laughs> Although uh, you, you can, if, if you have the resources and aren't uh, out of work and totally and utterly broke, uh, go to mysubscriberstar.com slash jeff-cliff. Buy our Take 1% of your stimulus checks and send it to the Church of... No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, I, I am a reverend in the United States. I, do qualify <laughs> there you under, go. I don't know if that gives me any kind of tax exempt status there, but I'm uh, not here in Canada. But just so you all know, that I will be with you all next week. Uh, thank you all for listening, and I will catch you all next year. Thanks for having me, Jeff. Thanks.